But since we're on the economy a little bit, I appreciate maybe if Russia isn't your exact wheelhouse, but I did want to get your initial reaction because earlier on in the year, we saw that quite unusual first in 10 years reshuffle in Putin's government, uh, Shoigu switching across to the Security Council um, and Belosov becoming the defense minister. But Belosov is an economic guy. He's a finance guy. Um, what does this tell us about the Russian approach to this? It's a wartime economy. Um, and generally, any other thoughts you've got about... Um, oh, actually, one last point. When this was happening, I made a video about the reaction because one of the things the Kremlin Knights like to... Uh, celebrate is the the ruble to the dollar, right? It, they were celebrating that it had gone down from 93 to 87. But if you look at the long-term time horizon in 2014, it was $33 uh, rubles to a dollar, right? So they're very selective and, well, propagandist in, in what they're showing. What What's your takeaways from this reshuffle and generally uh, Russia's economic state? Mm. You know, the price of the ruble to dollar in 2014, it's human nature to focus on the short term. It's just easier for the human brain to comprehend last three days, last three weeks, last three months. It's hard to think about well, what, what was it 10 years ago? Like, we just don't feel that the same. So I just want to make that comment. That's but fair. concerning the political reshuffling of, of Russia's defense minister, Shoigu was corrupt and Shoigu was incompetent, but he was loyal. He never betrayed Putin. He did and said everything Putin wanted him to do and say. So Shoigu, as of now, has not been pushed out a window or been served a special cup of tea. So Putin <laughs> knew that he needed to change up. And uh, Putin thinks he's pretty smart. So Putin put in charge of the military an economist, Belisov. And this serves two purposes. One, Putin wants somebody who understands economic and business in order to clamp down on corruption in the military and to convert the Russian economy into a permanent wartime economy. War is what we do in Russia. War is going to be Russia's main export behind oil and gas. But, but also, I think Putin wanted somebody in charge of the military with no military experience. If you're scared about losing power or having a palace coup, then the defense minister is probably going to be part of that coup group. I don't think Shoigu ever had the spine to do that. But Putin wanted to change him, and he wanted to change him with somebody with no military experience that wouldn't be a threat to him. Mm. So Belisov shows up in meetings wearing a civilian suit. He doesn't even have a military uniform. <laughs> so the idea that the military would ever commit a coup against Putin when the guy in charge of the military is an economist, this makes Putin sleep better at nights. He feels more comfortable knowing that a bean counter is in charge of, of the military and not somebody like Sorovikin somebody mm -hmm. with actual command and military experience who has the admiration and respect of his soldiers. But do you not think that there is a concern here that if Putin is uh, is making these changes and, and what we have seen to be a, a more resilient Russian economy, that perhaps the end result of, uh, to quote uh, Jason Smart, who we had on the show, you know, the change is going to come from within Russia, right? Not necessarily on the battlefield. I was quite surprised Jason, um, Jason said that he didn't think that the Ukrainians would win the war outright. It was more about Russia being unable to continue um, that coupled with giving Ukraine uh, as much as we can would be the, the deciding factor. Um, you know, you disagree with that notion. You, you think it is about giving Ukraine everything and whether or not Russia internally fragmented. No, I agree with right. Jason J. Smart. Right. I think okay. the most likely scenario for this war to end is for there to be a political or economic crisis inside of Russia and the military just can't continue and they, they pull out of the occupied territories. There's so much turmoil and disruption internally that the troops want to go home and they don't, they don't want to fight this war anymore. They're not willing to fight this war anymore. Your $2,000 check a month can't even buy groceries for the month for your family. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot more we could be doing to precipitate this, but the idea that we're going to give Ukraine every weapon they need to go on the offensive, that would be very... Uh, a lot of Ukrainian soldiers would die, in my opinion, going on the offensive to liberate all the territory, while Russia can still perfectly regenerate their forces inside of Russia. If right. Ukraine is killing a thousand a day and Russia is recruiting a thousand a day, well, well, that's 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 a standstill. Even if we give Ukraine more weapons and Ukraine starts killing two thousand Russian soldiers a day, 
we know what Russia's going to do. They're just going to start conscripting, drafting, mobilizing 2,000 a day to make up for their losses. So there has to be a spark at home. There has to be some kind of political or economic crisis so bad, like we haven't seen since Russia in the 90s or Russia in the late 1910s. Uh, but yeah, it's, it, history has shown us it's possible and it's likely if Putin continues on this path. Yeah, I, I agree. I think, you know, someone who studied Russia, as I have for my education, it's uh, 1917, you shifted from World War I to the Civil War. Uh, and it's uh, it's not really something that Russia is not known for is these uh, moments of major or even the three day coup in August 1991 with Yeltsin and the tank. I mean, fascinating and, and the White House, although not that kind of White House.